Hey, Open Life, how are you guys doing? Yeah. Guys, I won't lie, I want to go into like every space with that as my theme song. I think that would be awesome if that happened. <laughs> but I am extremely excited to be here today. And you know, like one thing I've really been enjoying lately is this Jesus Is series. Have you guys been loving it? Yeah. I really have because as each week passes, I feel like I'm getting closer and closer to God and I'm understanding Jesus on a whole new level. And I'm hoping that that has been the same for you. But you know, as I was asked to preach, I was like, you know what? What has, been, what has Jesus been to me in the last few months? You know, the season I've been in. And with the roller coaster of what life can be like, what has been so evident is that, and this is my topic today, is that Jesus is always with us. And I'll say it again, Jesus is always with us. So when I was like thinking in scripture, where does Jesus say that, you know? And it's actually his final words before he is taken up to heaven. Did you guys know that? His final concluding words when he speaks on the Great Commission, which you can find in Matthew 28, verses 19 to 20, where Jesus says, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Well, so powerful there was the last sentence. It says, I am with you always to the end of the age. So when I was younger, uh, many years ago, I was living in this double-story house, and sometimes my family would be out, and I'd be home alone. Uh, and I'd be, I don't know who cheered there, but cool, yes, awesome. Uh, <laughs> home alone <laughs> squad. Uh, and, you know, I would be upstairs and I'd be chilling and everything was fine. And one night, so it was dark, and in, on the kitchen counter, there were plates stacked up. And they were kind of uneven and one of them fell and it broke. When I heard this upstairs, I'm like, oh my goodness, someone's breaking in. What do I do? So I'm like, oh no, I run into my parents' room, I get a baseball bat. Don't ask me why we had a baseball bat, but we did. And after that, I was like, okay, okay. Uh, and my voice hadn't broken yet. So I was like, I need to intimidate this intruder. So I was like, okay, cool, I'm gonna put on a deep voice. I was like, you know what? I'll beat you up, okay, get out of my house. I, I, I was saying that. And you know, after that, I'm like, okay, and now I need to make a really loud sound. So I was like, okay, cool, that will scare him off. So I look down the stairs, I take the baseball bat and I throw it down and it makes a loud sound. But then I was like, oh no, I don't have a weapon anymore. <laughs> and I've left the intruder with a baseball bat. Oh, this is bad. So then I run into my room and I'm, I'm scared, I'm full of anxiety and my mom comes home and she's like, Cam, it was just the plate. The problem though is that I now developed this like fear of the dark, you know? And I had, uh, my mom would give me this responsibility to do, I don't know if you guys had to do the same, but basically when, uh, at the end of the day, my mom would be like, Cam, can you go downstairs and can you switch off all the lights? So I would go downstairs and I'd be like, oh no, okay, okay, one, two, three, and I'll switch off the light and I'll run upstairs and I'll, I'll just be like, oh, okay, cool. I dodged whoever was down there, whoever appeared as soon as I switched off the lights, you know? And then one day my friend came over for a sleepover. And my mom was like, same thing, can you guys go downstairs and switch off the lights? What was fascinating is that when I went downstairs, there was no fear, there was no anxiety. I had my friend with me, switched off the lights and we strolled upstairs. I was at peace. You know what it made me think was the power of having someone there with you. The presence, the power of presence. You know, and, and I would even ask you guys, when have you ever been afraid of something or to do something and just having someone there changed everything? And, you know, I was even thinking like having a human being with me transferred my, you know, while well, my fear and anxiety, it changed into peace and confidence. And, and it made me think, how different would our lives look if we approached it in the reality that Jesus is with us? The fear, the anxiety, it would all go away. But a lot of us, we don't live in that reality. You know, I was saying how I was afraid of the dark in terms of nighttime. But most of the time for a lot of us, the dark can be life's challenges, life's hardship. You know, one moment life is going really great. It's good. And then boom, you're in debt. Oh no, my marriage is falling apart. Addiction is taking over my life. I've lost my job and I cannot find another job at this point. The darkness creeps in. And then the lie comes in of, Jesus has abandoned me. He's no longer with me, I thought he was. 
That is a lie. And you know, I was thinking about, I was in that space a few months ago, actually. It got dark real quick. Things were fine. You know, I was at church, I was serving, you know, like you think, like by doing those things, you're going to avoid all of those challenges. And I was driving home one night and the cops stopped me and they physically assaulted me for no reason. I went through trauma. I had to go to the hospital. I had to get counseling. It was hard to deal with. Around that time, my family also went through division. A, a thing happened and, you know, I lost security and stability at home. I don't know if you guys have been there where, where things are just going wrong. And, you know, the thought I had was, Jesus, where are you? You've abandoned me. But then as I was going through the book of Acts, there was a story in chapter 16 where we look at Paul and Silas. So Paul and Silas, they're on their way to pray. And now imagine there's a slave girl there and she's possessed by a spirit. So Paul casts out the spirit, but her owners, because she was a slave girl, got mad at this because they were getting gains from that. So they got so mad, they took Paul and Silas and they took them to court and they got beaten, stripped, and they were thrown into jail. How brutal is that? And I was thinking, if I was in their position, I would be feeling hopeless. I'd be like, why is this happening to me? And that's where I was too. I was like, oh, I'm hopeless. Why is this happening? I thought I was good. I thought all of these different things. Jesus, where are you? The difference with Paul and Silas though is when they got thrown into jail, they were singing and they were praising God. Imagine, despite their circumstances, despite being beaten, despite being thrown into jail, they were praising and singing to God. And to be vulnerable with you guys, when this was happening to me, when I came to church, I struggled. I struggled to sing. And it's because I wasn't living in the reality that Jesus was with me. And that's the difference with Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas put their security and stability in Jesus. They knew Jesus was with them, so they could praise and sing to him. But you know, I got to a point where I was like, this is too much. I'm not healing. And there's a verse in 1 John 4, uh, verses 15, which says, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. You know, I'd always have this mentality that I had to earn it or, you know, like I have to do something. But here it says, if you confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God's real authentic presence is with you. And as, I was, as we saw in Matthew, it doesn't say he's with you sometimes. Jesus said, I'm with you always. And that's the difference. And you know, when I started accepting that, I was like, you know what? I'm not going to do this on my own strength anymore. When I'm struggling, I'm going to run to God. I'm going to sit with God because he's with me. And you know what happened? Over time, I started smiling again. Joy started entering my life. When I got to church, I started singing again. And I was starting to understand why Paul and Silas were praising and singing to God. And it was just this thing of that I was experiencing comfort that I couldn't explain from Jesus. You can't explain it. And when I would come to church, I'd even find some of my friends might have been struggling. And that comfort that I received from God, I could pour it into them. There's a verse in 2 Corinthians 1 verses 4 which says, He always comes alongside us to comfort us in every suffering so that we can come alongside those who are in any painful trial. We can bring them the same comfort that God has poured out upon us. Did you know comfort in Greek is called parakelio? Its direct translation isn't, oh, shame, I'm sorry, but it's actually come close beside and come together. And that's what Jesus does. That's what God does. When you're going through suffering, he comes beside you. He gives you strength when we come together with him, but in such a way that we can then pour that into other people. And that's when I realized that is so linked to our purpose. Because as Christians, reality is when we're trying to follow God's plan, attacks can happen. You're gonna face trials and, and tribulations. You know, the false mentality I had is, oh, now that I'm Christian, I'm good. But that's the thing we face Challenges, but that, that's why now it says in scripture that 
now God can comfort us in such a way that we can then go and pour that out to other people who may be in the darkness, who may be suffering, who may feel like they are abandoned. And, you know, a false perception I also had was that, especially when I was in the trials, was that Sunday is the only place I'll find God. That's the only place I should fulfill my purpose. But friends, I want to tell you right now, God's presence isn't just here. It's with you always. So on a Monday, when you wake up and it's the start of the week and you're like, oh, Jesus is with you there. Jesus is with you in the car. Jesus is with you in every conversation that you have. And so especially Jesus is with you when you go out and you reach people. And that's why I love this campaign that we're doing. We're going out to reach people. We're fulfilling the Great Commission. And Jesus knew it was going to be hard. And that's why he says at the end, I will be with you always. And we can take comfort in that. But why we need to go and reach people is because people are out there in the darkness, scared, fear, anxiety, and they have no one with them. And that's why it's so important for us. But I just want to conclude with, if you came here today and you were feeling like I'm in the darkness, the fear, the anxiety, the stress, I don't see a way out. Remember that Jesus didn't say he's with you sometimes. He's with you always. Thank you. Cool. Guys, I just want to welcome the next preacher, my good friend Jesse, and he's got a wonderful word for you guys to give him a hand. And your next contestant is... No, I'm just kidding. Uh, it's definitely not about us. Uh, I actually think it's really cool that I get to go off the camera, and although it's difficult preaching after such a good message, but I think there's something special that God is threading in between our messages, and I think that my message actually builds on to his, so it's no coincidence that I'm, that I'm going next. But first, a bit of context into my story. So for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Jesse. Uh, I grew up in Cape Town, and I grew up in a Christian family. I uh, went to church most Sundays. I was lucky enough to have parents who model a godly marriage. We prayed before bedtime and before meals. Um, we had Bible stories. Ah, that one, watch VeggieTales. Who else here watched VeggieTales? Are you really a Christian if you didn't watch VeggieTales? No, I'm just kidding. That's, that, that's not my preach today. That is not the message I've come here to share. But all of that to say, I knew about Jesus, but I don't really think, if I'm honest, I knew who he was. You know, and it's amazing that we're in this series about who Jesus was. It drew me back to a time when I thought I knew who Jesus was, but I didn't. And for me, this all changed when I went on youth camp in grade eight. You know, I remember being super excited because I'd been part of Sunday school up until grade seven, and now I could join the big boys in youth. <laughs> like, I was one of them. I could go on camp away from my family for a couple of days. I felt really cool. And so we went to a campsite about four hours outside of Cape Town, and our days were filled with preachers and sermons and praise and worship. And I just remember encountering the presence of Jesus, you know, encountering this, this peace and joy and being filled with zeal and energy and just ready to go and change the world, you know, like, sure, God, is this what it feels like? Like, I'm, I'm leveling up, man. Is this what it feels like? You know, I felt like I could uh, find the cure for cancer or uh, stop world, world hunger or even, I even thought I could learn how to be gracious towards Man United supporters. Uh, Kuda, Kuda over here in the front who uh, can probably attest to the fact that, yeah, I think, I think God is still doing a work there. Uh, but don't worry, if you're a Man United supporter, Jesus loves you. I, I just might not. Anyway, anyway. So I had this, this fire inside of me, and we had this, this cliche term we would use. We'd say we were on fire for the Messiah. So, yeah, pretty, pretty cool, but I also sort of cringe when I say it. I don't know if you guys have those same Christianese terms, but it's a cool one. Uh, unfortunately, though, as, as weeks turn into months and life got busy with school and sport and life throws you curves balls, and then, you know, as a teenager, your friends start to think it's, it's not that cool that you spend more time with this person named Jesus than us. Slowly but surely, that fire began to dwindle. You know, I really wanted to be a part of God's bigger plan, but seeing his kingdom come slowly slipped down my priority list. 
and then the next year youth camp would come around again and I'd level up once more, you know, I'm ready to change the world. But nothing actually changed. Now, I don't know about for you guys, but for me, as much as I'd like to say that that stayed in my teenage years, unfortunately, I've seen time and time again in my life that scenario continues to play out. You know, we continue, we, sorry. People encounter Jesus in a moment, you know. They, they encounter his presence, the goodness and the peace, the, the abundance of his joy in his presence. And we're changed from the inside. You know, our intentions change, our motivations change. And we make these incredible plans to impact the world through building his church. But then what happens is we wait till the next Sunday to continue building, you know. We, we want to be part of this magnificent, extraordinary plan, but we aren't always so interested in the everyday, ordinary works. You know, we, we want to come and learn how to live this life, but we actually forget to live it. You know, God didn't sacrifice his one and only son on the cross to then just wipe his hands and say, peace out, guys, cheers, I'm good. No, he left us with his son, with the Holy Spirit that empowers us, that fills us with wisdom and truth. And, and don't get me wrong, all Jesus needs is a moment. Just a moment with Jesus can change your life forever. And I pray that each of us have that moment. But he desires to walk alongside us in the ordinary. And so as I was thinking about this and who we can learn from in the Bible regarding the ordinary everyday excellence, a person that came to mind is Jeremiah. Now, many of us may have heard of Jeremiah, but don't know too much about him. Basically, he was a, a prophet. Uh, and by human standards, he actually lived a pretty ordinary life. You know, he didn't slay any giants or he didn't part any seas, but he still managed to live a life that continually pursued God's will despite everything else and pointed towards the coming of Jesus. And the reason I think he was able to do that was because he learned very early on and was reminded throughout his story how to live an excellent life, an extraordinary life in the ordinary. You know, it says in Jeremiah, and many of us, many of us know the scripture, it says that God encountered or, or Jeremiah encountered God, and, and God told him, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Now, if I'm Jeremiah and I have this moment with God, it even says that God touched his lips and put his words in his mouth. If I have this moment and God says, I set you apart, like, I'm going to, similar to the feeling I had on camps, I'm going to feel like, okay, God, use me, you know? Like, I'm ready, send me. Uh, tell me about all the miracles we're going to do. Tell me about the nations we're going to tear down, and tell me how I'm going to rule over people. But instead of that, God, in his very first vision of prophecy that he gives to Jeremiah, shows him the branch of an almond tree. Now, for some context, in that day, and even until today, almond trees are completely ordinary objects. It's something that Jeremiah would have seen every single day. You know, and later on in his life, after Jeremiah has been through a bit of a, a tricky patch, you know, life has got tough, and he's struggling to see how God's plan is going to work out in the ordinary, how his people are going to turn back to him. God decides to remind Jeremiah once more about the ordinary, so he sends him to the potter's house. Again, a potter is someone that was completely necessary in the day because they made jars for food, they made bricks, clay bricks for, for building, they even made the writing material of the day. But what's even more amazing about a potter is that a potter doesn't use expensive gold and metal and diamonds, a potter uses clay. An ordinary, everyday, common, inexpensive, but it's what they have available. And he makes something beautiful out of that. And in both of these situations, with the almond tree and with the clay, there was something meaningful that God was saying, but he used ordinary, everyday objects to tell Jeremiah this. It was as if he was saying, Jeremiah, yes, I have extraordinary plans for you, but let me first remind you of the ordinary. As if you were saying, don't wait on the extraordinary resources to go and live out my life. Use the everyday almond trees and clay. You know, Eugene Peterson, uh, the guy who wrote the message version of the Bible, he wrote a book about Jeremiah, and he came to this conclusion about what faith is, and I love it. It says, for faith is not a leap out of the everyday, but a plunge into its depths. Now say it once more, for faith is not a leap out of the everyday, but a plunge into its depths. So how do we plunge as a church into the everyday depths of life? You know, I really believe that as a church, when we begin to translate what we feel and hear and see 
within these four walls, within the youth camps and the conferences, when we begin to translate that into our everyday lives, that is when we're going to see Jesus' kingdom coming like never before. You know, imagine what our world would look like if we chose to intentionally fill every single conversation with truth, with grace, with love. You know, imagine what our work weeks would look like if we carried the same praise that we experience on a Sunday into them. If instead of deciding to, to serve God on a Sunday, we also serve these people during the week. I think if we do that, instead of moments of prayer, we'd actually start to live a life of prayer. You know, instead of running to a quiet place to hear from God, we participate in this ongoing conversation. And slowly but surely, our spiritual eyes will begin to be opened to the extraordinary power that exists in the everyday. But that being said, I am a super practical person. And if I don't make ways for things to get done, I sometimes never do them. And so I want to leave you guys with something practical, a way that we can live this out in the everyday. And it fits in perfectly with our Belong to Build campaign. You know, as a church, we truly believe that each and every person belongs to Build. But that doesn't have to stay on this church property or in the youth conferences or any of those situations where we come out of our homes. Actually, I believe that God is calling us to start building in our homes. You know, there's power in inviting people into our homes. Instead of saying to God, I'm ready, send me out to the nation, send me out and help me to do all the miracles in your name, Lord, why don't we just invite people in? You know, instead of using our homes as a place where we run to when we need uh, to hide away from the world or we're tired or worn out, why can't it be a place where people run to to get healing? You know, I think God has called us to an extraordinary bold, adventurous life, but we don't step into that by merely confining to these four walls. After all, Jesus was hospitable, right? He was actually the most hospitable person ever, so hospitable that he invited himself over to your place, right? So next time I rock up, or any of you guys decide to rock up to someone else's place uninvited, just say you're trying to be like Jesus, right? Best excuse. But in all seriousness, it doesn't have to be complicated, you know? Prepare a meal, uh, invite Jesus in conversation, put your cell phone aside, and watch as faith is stirred around your dinner table, and hope is restored, and chains are broken, and idols are torn down. <laughs> and lives are changed. You know, I think, as I said, there's this bold, adventurous, excellent, extraordinary life waiting for us. But God is calling us to use what we have, our everyday means, our everyday almond trees and, and almond branches and clay and potters to change people's lives and see his kingdom come. And so in conclusion, I just want to leave you with this verse uh, as I end. It's from Colossians 2, verse 6 to 7 in the message version. It says, my counsel for you is simple and straightforward. Just go ahead with what you've been given. You've received Christ Jesus, the master. Now live him. You're deeply rooted in him. You're well constructed upon him. You know your way around the faith. School's out. Quit studying the subject and start loving it. Cool. Thanks, guys. So I'd love to invite Rebecca up for the next portion of it. And morning. Are you guys good? I'm Rebecca, for those who don't know me, and I come here often. I pretty much live here, uh, but not. Um, so I'm going to start by telling you a little bit of my story, and I hope that I'll be able to encourage you. It's a lot of pressure to come, come as the last one after Cameron and Jesse, and I feel like a, a proud mom of them, even though we are almost the same age. We look like the same age. That's probably better. Ah, yeah. Moving on. So I've been serving in the worship space since I was nine years old. What were you doing when you were nine? Okay, good chat. 
And I have always felt like God called me into the worship ministry. So I started playing instruments when I was four. So it was very natural for me to have that, that ability with, with music. But the only issue is, as I grew up, my identity got very attached to what I did. I was no longer Rebecca Bastos, which was my maiden name. I was Rebecca, the worship leader. Rebecca, the musician. Rebecca, the pastor's kid. That's an issue right there. And I think that without me realizing, I, repl- I made my calling my God. And now my God gave me the calling. And I think that, I don't know, but that happens, hey? And we not even realize. It's just like, boom, oh, I am this now. And because, and because of how I grew up, I always thought I needed to earn God's love. So for me, when I started playing and I started leading worship and people started raising their hands, oh, there's one, two, three, five people raised their hands while I was singing. I felt like God was finally pleased with me. And I thought that finally, maybe, just maybe, now he loves me. 2019 came. And yes, it wasn't a pandemic, but I had my own pandemic. And I felt God saying, it's time to stop. And I don't know if you were a doer or just a, uh, like a, a beer, but I'm a doer. And for me to be told to stop was a big deal. And I remember writing on my journal, and I said... If you keep going, this is your end. If I let it go, God will take me further. And I think I was very close to burnout, burn out, but the thought of letting it go was so scary. What if this was it? What if I never stepped on stage again? What if I never sung again? What if I never played my guitar again? God will never love me again. Because that was who I was. Rebecca without a guitar is just nothing. And as clear as in anything, and sometimes I wish God wasn't so clear, but sometimes he's really clear, and then when we really want him to be clear, he's not clear. But that day he was extremely clear. And it was all caps. And he said, if this was all, if this is all we ever done in your life, am I still enough for you? Is being called my daughter enough for you? And because I'm very honest, even with God, I said, no, it's not enough. I can't just be a daughter You're not going to love me if I'm just a daughter. As I'm looking at the series, Jesus is, and we have heard a lot about what Jesus is. Big words like omniscient. And then Jesus is sleeping. Plot twitch, he's not. Jesus is all in. Jesus is the source, the south. And I started reading through Matthew and Luke. And I realized that in the first chapters of Matthew and Luke, there's nothing about the big moments of Jesus. In fact, it talks about his birth, his genealogy, and then his baptism in the ordinary, right? Luke 3.21 said, when all the people were baptized, Jesus also got baptized. He was praying. Heaven opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him like a physical appearance, like a dove. Ordinary. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, and with you I'm well pleased. Jesus was about 30 years old when he began his public ministry. If you're 30, you're good. 
Jesus was known as the son of Joseph. Joseph was the son of Heli. Heli was the son of, 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 son of Adam, son of God. And this is my title. Jesus is the son of God. What I find fascinating is that when God called Jesus, he didn't say, Jesus, you. Type seven on Enneagram. Personality type, A, B, C, D, J, K, whatever. He called him son. And then he began his ministry. And I wonder if sometimes we wait to be called the chief of natural and supernatural ministries before we start something. And all God wants to call us is son, daughter, with you, I'm well pleased. So my question to you today is, who you are a son of? Who you are a daughter of? After that, pointing the, the story in Luke, Jesus goes to the wilderness and he's tempted with three things. And these three things actually goes direct, attacking his sonship to God. So the first one is, if you, if, so Luke 4, let's, Luke 4. If you are the son of God, thou tell the stone to become a loaf of bread. But Jesus is the son of God. He knows his provision comes from his father. The second one was, he showed the kingdoms and he said, I'll give you all the glory. If you worship me, I'll give you the authority of them if you worship me. But Jesus knew he was a son of God. The kingdom is already his. We don't need to worship anything else to inherit the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven belongs to his sons and daughters. And the third thing is, the devil took him to Jerusalem to the highest point of the temple and he said, I always imagine the voice of the devil. <laughs> if you are the son of God, jump off. But Jesus knew he was the son of God. And his power come from his father. He, needed, he didn't need to jump off or show off. Because he's already had the power that was given to him through his father. I wonder how many of us have been tested in who we are. I thought I was just a worship leader. So when the enemy came, he said, are you just that? What are you without it? I didn't know who I was. And I wonder how many of us are in the same trap and we don't know who we are because we don't know who our father is. I wonder if sometimes we doubt that being a daughter and a son is just not good enough. And I wonder how many times we let people say that being a son and a daughter of the most high God doesn't cut it. Being a son and a daughter of someone means a lot, right? For me, if you meet my parents, you probably say, you look just like your mom. And my dad, you, you are just like your dad. Your personality, you are loud, which are really not. I'm super quiet, toned down. But sometimes, <laughs> it's not just our personality and the looks we get from our parents. Sometimes we inherit burdens, sickness, hurt, things we actually didn't sign up to. If you know my mom, she's beautiful. You will never know that she is almost 70. I just don't know her age, actually. But she's beautiful. You know that every single morning, she steps on a scale, and she lets the scale tell who she is. So guess what? My, my, my husband didn't allow me to buy a scale because I would be exactly the same. My insecurity about how I look, how much I weigh, determines a lot of how my humor is going to be or my, what do you call that? My mood is going to be. The most difficult carrot of God for me is that he's a loving father. 
And I know I grew up with a loving father, but he was also an angry man. So I struggle to believe that God looks at me and say, Rebecca, my beloved daughter, with you I'm well pleased. God, but I'm not with it. I'm always wrong. I never do things right. How do you love me? How can I be loved by a father that not even knows if I'm doing right or wrong? Does anyone feel like that? That sometimes you need to earn the love of a father? For me, the break was supposed to be three months because I tried, like, I'm sure I can be better and get healed. In all of this burnout things, I can be done in three months because I can control time, right? But it was in 2019, and I think I'm sorry about lockdown, but I think it was my fault (laughs) because I needed the break. (laughs) My pleasure. But I think the first time I led worship again was in 2021. And I'll never take leading worship or stepping on the stage for granted. Because I know when God looks at me now, he says, Rebecca, my daughter, with you, I'm well pleased. And maybe today, it's time for you to ask yourselves, are you a son or a daughter of God? Because the beautiful thing is, Jesus is the son of God, and he made a way for us to be sons and daughters of God. Because the story goes that that Jesus was like, cool, I don't want to heaven just by myself. Come on, let's go. Because God so loved the world, you and I, we're doing things right, doing things wrong. That He gave His only and unique Son as a gift. So now everyone who believes in Him will never perish, but experience everlasting Father. Jesus is the Son of God. I am a daughter of God. And that's the only title I'll ever want to be.